Welcome to today's webinar for the National Ombudsman Reporting System, or NORS, training. This webinar will review the Part 1 training materials on case, complainant, and complaint, and information and assistance. Attendees for today's webinar include state ombudsmen and representatives of the Office of the State Long-Term Care Ombudsman. Representatives of the office, often called local or regional ombudsmen, are our target audience today. Today is the second of five webinars created specifically for those of you in the field who provide direct ombudsman program services. Our speakers are Louise Ryan, Ombudsman Program Specialist with the Administration on Aging, Administration for Community Living, Maria Green, NORC Consultant, and Amity, Overall Labe on the NORC Director. Just so you know, attendees are muted currently. If you have questions, please submit those in the control panel of your screen. Later on today, we're gonna to go through the quiz that's part of the part one training materials, and we will address some questions in between quiz questions and answers, as well as more questions at the end of the webinar. So feel free to submit your questions if they're about specific quiz answers as we go through that quiz later today. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Today's agenda includes an introduction to NORS, discussion of the basic principles for case, complaint, and consultation and information and assistance, a quick review of Table 1, the NORS Part A, B, and C, audience participation in answering quiz questions and reviewing tips, and a general question and answer session. We'll also provide you with a, rem a reminder of the resources that we currently have available on the NORC website. For today's webinar and the rest of this series, we are focusing on the basics of NORS reporting. Due to the NORS data collection changing, effective October 1st, we updated our training materials to reflect those changes. The purpose of these webinars is to review the new training materials and talk about the basics of reporting in order to improve reporting consistency. There's often turnover among program leadership, staff, and volunteers. So we wanna focus on the basics for now and ensure everyone's on the same page. We're in the process of developing frequently asked questions for the revised NORS, and we will address gray areas of reporting in those FAQs and in future training. Next slide, please. Now I'd like to welcome Louise Ryan, Ombudsman Program Specialist, Administration for Community Living, to discuss the importance of NORS data collection and provide a brief reminder about why it's been revised. Go ahead, Louise. Thank you, Amity. And next slide, please. So um, we, just to give a little background, and this might be old news to you, but um, we don't want to assume that everybody's on the call that was on the call last time. So NORS, as you often know it as, the National Ombudsman Reporting System, was developed back in 1995, and it has served as the data collection tool for ombudsman programs all these years. And the purpose of NORS, there's many purposes, but it stems from the requirement in the Older Americans Act to have state ombudsmen collect and analyze data that relates to the complaints and experiences of residents in long-term care facilities. Um, it also talks about such things as the successes of the program and the barriers. So it asks for a lot of information and the way that that information is gathered is through NORS and then state ombudsmen are required to then report that information to ACL and to other entities. So it's not meant to be a report that stays in hiding and is top secret, but rather that this report is used to, um, by the state ombudsman program and by ACL um, to share with other entities, such as licensing and certification, um, maybe your adult protective services program, uh, the legislature, uh, to really describe the experiences of residents. Um, next slide. So um, what's going on now with NORS is that we have developed, uh, revised the NORS, and we did that in coordination with a variety of stakeholders, such as local ombudsmen, uh, state ombudsmen, 
the agencies that house your programs. So a lot of uh, input over time. And, and it also went through a public review and we took public comments as well to in order to get approval from the Office of Management and Budget. Um, so, you know, this is kind of the bit, first big overhaul of NORS um, since 1995. There have been these small changes over time, but this is the most significant change. And our goals for doing this was, a big one was to simplify the codes, <clears throat> excuse me, and the number of data elements to, um, therefore, then we hope to increase the reliability and accuracy of NORS data, and then also, most important is to better get a better understanding of what residents experience. Um, so for instance, when states report uh, their new NORS data, it will be in a new uh, reporting software tool. So that was happening at the same time. And this the way that states will report in the future will allow uh, us at ACL to really get a sense of the not only the types of complaints, but how those were resolved. Was there a referral associated to that complaint, like a referral to licensing and certification? Um, we will be able to see for the complaint types um, the outcome of that complaint. So for, say, the transfer discharge complaints, what percent of those were satisfactorily or, satisfactorily or partially resolved? So we'll have a much deeper understanding of what you do and the experience of residents. And so I'm, of course, looking forward to this new system that we will be um, starting to use um, coming up uh, this year and next year. Um, the other thing that we are doing is um, getting a different uh, information about the programs themselves, which we think will also better inform the w what you do and then how we can use that information. Um, next slide. So how do we use NORS data? And again, just quickly recapping, since I did uh, talk about this in the last session, but we use it in a variety of ways. Um, we use it to inform policy um, at the federal level and then in your programs at the state and local level. At the federal level, we do use it for budget justification. Um, we use it when we look at programmatic issues and to educate the public. And um, by educating the public, that happens in a variety of ways, of course. That could be through the, through the media, uh, responding to individual inquiries. Uh, researchers often have questions. Um, and then you might have seen that we had a blog that went out a couple of weeks ago from our Assistant Secretary, Lance Robertson, where he used the NORS data to celebrate the program describe the issues that residents experience, including a couple of um, complaint examples, which all of that came from NORS. Um, so, and finally, I'd like to say, you know, most important of all of this that we talk about with NORS, most important is that the work that you do and the documentation of that work um, is not collected anywhere else. So you are the, um, and the ombudsman program, you know, being solely focused on the resident and their health, safety, and welfare and rights, that um, you are telling their story. Um, and even if you're telling the story through numbers, it's telling us what, what are the experience of, res of residents. And the resident-centered approach that you take to complaint handling means that you are truly reflecting their problems and their needs. And this is incredibly valuable information, and I just want to extend my appreciation for your work and for the documentation of your work. I know it takes time, but it's so important because it magnifies the resident voice. So thank you. And with that, I will turn it over to Amity. Next slide. Thank you, Louise. Similar to the current NORS training materials, the documents are basic principles, 
a quiz and the quiz answer sheet for each of the four parts. These materials were emailed to registrants last week and they're available to download in the control panel on your screen. Just so you know, the training materials are also available in black and white and on the website at that link right there, along with the NORS table term ACL. The slides and recording from today's webinar will be included on the website with these materials so programs can use them for training in the months before implementation of the revised NORS. For today's webinar, our main focus is how to use the revised NORS codes and definitions for a case, complaint, complainant, and information and assistance. We will review the relevant case data components from Table 1 of the revised NORS data collection. However, not all data elements in Table 1 are applicable for responding to the Part 1 quiz. Next slide, please. Thank you. This is a snapshot of the resource document NORS Training Part 1, Case Complaint and Complainant and Information and Assistance Basic Principles. Each part of the revised NORS training includes a basic principles resource with important explanations and reminders. During today's webinar, we will highlight the changes in the revised training materials due to the revised NORS data collection, but most of the information for part one training is similar to the current training materials. For these materials in the webinar going forward, the term ombudsman is used as a generic term that may mean the state ombudsman, a representative of the office, or the ombudsman program. We will discuss case and complaint and information and assistance basic principles and tips in the next several slides. Next slide, please. <clears throat> As you may have noticed already, if you took a look at these materials before the webinar, the definition of a case in the revised NORS is much more specific than the current NORS. This should help improve consistency in understanding what elements are necessary to have a case. Today we are discussing the components of a case. A case is, is comprised of a complainant, one or more complaints, documentation of a perpetrator for cases involving abuse, gross neglect, and exploitation, a setting, verification, resolution, and information regarding any referrals to another agency. Next slide. Each case must have at least one complaint. The definition in the revised NORS for a complaint is again very similar to the current NORS and that a complaint is an expression of dissatisfaction or concern brought to or initiated by the Ombudsman Program, which requires Ombudsman Program investigation and resolution on behalf of one or more residents of a long-term care facility. So I just want to reiterate the important, especially the, um, and highlight the uh, part of this definition that the complaint requires action by the Ombudsman Program to investigate and resolve on behalf of one or more residents of a facility. That's really important to remember when you're trying to determine if it's a case um, or information and assistance. Next slide, please. A complainant is an individual who requests Ombudsman Program complaint investigation services regarding one or more complaints made by or on behalf of residents. In the revised NORS, the definition for resident representative is from the Ombudsman Program rule. And it is an individual chosen by the resident to act on behalf of the resident in order to support the resident in decision making, accessing medical, social, or other personal information, and managing or managing financial matters or receiving notifications. Could be a person authorized by the state or federal law, such as power of attorney, representative payee, or other fiduciaries, to act on behalf of the resident. It could be a legal representative or a court-appointed guardian or conservator. A friend is a non-relative with a personal relationship with the resident, as identified by the resident or complainant. And family is a spouse, sibling, or other relative, as identified by the resident or complainant. Next slide, please. <clears throat> now, this is a little bit different than the current NORS, and that consultation in the current NORS is now going to be called information and assistance. However, the activity defined is very similar to the current NORS. The revised NORS also no longer ask about the topics for information and assistance. However, your state may still want you to document that information. It's just up to your state ombudsman. 
program. Information and assistance is providing information to an individual or facility staff about issues impacting residents, such as resident rights, care issues, or services, and or sharing information about accessing services without opening a case and working to resolve a complaint. Next slide. <clears throat> the basic principles document provides additional clarification about the difference between a case and information and assistance. Information and assistance may be provided through various means, including, but not limited to, telephone, by written correspondence such as email, or in person. Again, it does not involve investigating and working to resolve complaints. The resident or resident representative, where applicable, has not provided direction and consent to investigate a complaint. Also, <clears throat> Directing an individual to contact another agency for assistance does not constitute a case. So now I'm going to turn it over to Maria Green to dig a little bit deeper into these materials. Hello, everyone. This is showing the snapshot of the basic principles case and complaint versus information and assistance. This document includes, includes three pages, so we're briefly going to cover those but it's gonna help you use it as a resource tool because it's gonna help you distinguish between what may be a case with a complaint or what is information and assistance. It's gonna be a helpful tool. It's one you might wanna keep nearby to reference. And as you can see, the NORS definitions for a case and complaint and information and assistance are at the top. And the rest of the chart outlines the requirements from the Long-Term Care Ombudsman Federal Final Rule regarding complaint processing compared to providing information and assistance. The first page is clearly, you know, the very same example and definition that Amity covered. Um, I won't read the definitions again, but they're there as a reference for you. And so we'll go to the next two slides that depict the total of the three pages that includes this resource document. So next slide. The snapshot of the second page. And I'll just highlight uh, one example from, from this page. At the top of the chart, it quotes the Ombudsman Rule regarding resident participation, stating that regardless of the source of the complaint, including when the source is the Ombudsman or the representative of the office, the Ombudsman or representative of the office must support and maximize resident participation in the process of resolving the complaint as follows. And it outlines step by step how the program must ensure the resident's participation. In contrast, the resident participation is not required when a person seeking some information and assistance, even if it's you know, the resident or not the resident, if it's provision of the information and assistance, that's the only thing you're doing is just providing them that information. And there's no need for you to take action to investigate a complaint. Next slide. This is the third page of this resource document. As you can see in the last row of the chart, it highlights the difference in documenting your work for cases and information and assistance. It reminds us that case notes documenting your work on a case is included within the case documentation or per your state requirements and is not reported as information and assistance activity. If information and assistance is provided that relates to the complaint investigation and the resolution process, that would be included in your case notes. In other words, don't count your complaint-related communications as information and assistance. That said, if you provide information and assistance on an issue not related to all of the complaint investigation process, then you would document that as providing information and assistance separate from the case. Information and assistance is documented as a program activity, and you use the code to demonstrate the type of person who made the request. So that could be an individual or a facility staff person. As we mentioned earlier, the revised NORS does not require the topics of information and assistance requests. Next slide. So if you were with us uh, for the first introductory webinar, this table one is familiar. 
It covers the parts A, B, and C for case and complaint codes, values, and definitions, and it's familiar to most of you. Um, this table one is 10 pages long, and it provides the pertinent information, including the definition, reporting tips, and examples. And so just as a reminder, as um, Annette said, in the handout section here on the GoToWebinar, you've got all of these resources and they're also on the website. Next slide. So these are the table one highlights and you see all the listings here of what would be in a case data component. The date that it's opened and closed, the facility setting, complainant. You may have one or more complaints, but you must have one complaint. And then what's new in the revised NORS is perpetrator and referral agency, verification, and disposition. So once again, the changes are in the red font. And in the revised NORS, programs now have to enter a code for the alleged perpetrator of abuse, neglect, or exploitation, meaning coding whether it was the facility staff, another resident, a family member, a resident representative or friend, or another individual who's alleged to have caused the abuse, neglect, or exploitation. Also in the new revised NORS, referring a complaint to another agency is no longer a disposition code. Now programs will enter a code for what type of agency the complaint was referred to. We encourage you to use refer to table one when you're going through all the uh, revised NORS training materials and taking the quiz as the table includes the definitions for case, complaint, and complainant. However, all the other case data components in table one that do not pertain to part one of the NORS training is not our focus for today. Next slide. Now we are going to review the tips provided in the quiz and then work through the quiz together. And here's a snapshot of the quiz and quiz answer sheets on the right-hand side of the screen. As you can see, both documents include tips and directions for trainees. The tips remind users that a case must have one or more complaints brought to or initiated by the Ombudsman Program by or on behalf of one or more residents. Each complaint requires ombudsman program investigation and resolution on behalf of one or more residents of the long-term care facility. States that have expanded their ombudsman program services to other settings may choose to report complaints as other settings. This was brought up in the introductory webinar and was a question that was posed before us. So just wanted to clarify that the code other settings is not a new code as it was called other in the current NORS. This code is to be used for complaints ombudsman programs investigate that are not in a long-term care facility. Use this code for ombudsman program services provided in other settings such as home care, adult daycare, managed care, and similar types of services or settings. Next slide. Okay. So we're getting to the part where we're going to ask you to participate. So hopefully you are near your computer screen. Um, for the quiz directions, we're going to be uh, working through and guiding with your help guide your responses to the poll questions. And so these are the important questions to ask yourself. Is this a case or is this an information and an assistance? So we'll give you the hypothetical scenario. We'll present the poll question. And then you're going to choose if it's a case or information and assistance. On some of them, we'll have additional follow-up and we'll talk about if it is a case, how many complaints are there, and also who is the complainant. So we ask you that when you're listening and looking at these um, hypothetical scenarios that you assume, please, that we have the consent of the resident or the resident's representative as applicable to take action. And as mentioned earlier, we will address some of the questions in between. So if you want to, I know if you're like me, it's easier to remember what your question was right now. You can go ahead and put it in the chat, um, in the chat box. And we'll address some of them as we go along and then hold some for the end. Next slide. Katie is gonna assist with the polling today. 
So this is scenario one. A woman calls asking for information on care planning and how to select a nursing home for her mother. She discusses specific concerns regarding the care, and the ombudsman spends an hour talking with the woman and sends additional follow-up information. And we'll go to the poll. We'll ask you to choose the correct answer. So the options are case, information and assistance, or neither. So I believe that Katie is going to administer, administer the poll and also give us the results. So 2% said case, and 98% said information and assistance, and 0% said neither. All right. We have a very smart group because, yes, the answer is B, information and assistance. All other requests were educational in nature and requests for additional information. Although the ombudsman spent a lot of time on the call, it did not result in further action. Rather, the ombudsman provided the information to empower the caller and search for her nursing home. So we'll go to the next question, scenario two. You visit Mrs. Jones, who tells you that they are still bringing her pureed food, even though her doctor said she could start eating regular food. You notice her call bill is also broken. She indicates she would appreciate your assistance in resolving these problems, and you speak to the director of nursing about the call bill, and the DON promptly gets that fixed. You attempt to talk to the dietitian about the pureed food, but she is not available until the next morning. You leave Mrs. Jones, but tell her that you will check back with the dietitian and will follow up with her on the results and to ensure that the call bill is still functional. So Katie, if you'll administer the poll, please. We ask that you choose the correct answer. Is this a case, information and assistance, or neither? Ninety-seven percent said case, two percent said information and assistance, and one percent said neither. So the correct information, a correct answer is that it's a case. And the complainant is Mrs. Jones, the resident. So although you noticed that the call bill, although you noticed the call bill, Mrs. Jones gave consent for you to work to get the call bill fixed. And therefore Mrs. Jones is the Jones is the complainant because there can only be one complainant for each case. So was the call bill a complaint or a request? There is a difference between an ombudsman responding to a concern and an ombudsman facilitating communication between the resident and the staff. If the ombudsman is simply the messenger, as in, would you ask someone to get me some water? Or could you tell the aide I'd like to go to the dining room now? Then it is not a complaint. Relaying the message does not require an investigation, a plan for resolution, or follow-up. However, in this instance, there is a problem which requires action, resolution, and follow-up, so it is a complaint. The ombudsman is doing more than just relaying a message. We'll go to the next scenario, please. Oh, it's not that we're staying on the same one, so we're still with Mrs. Jones in our call bell, but if you'll go to the next slide, that one right there, yep. We want to know how many complaints are in this case. And we want you to choose the correct answer when we administer the poll. Is there one complaint, two complaints, or three complaints? Thirteen percent said one, eighty six percent said two, and two percent said three. You know, sometimes I always hated those questions in school where you had multiple choice answers and it could possibly be one or the other. 
Um, but good job to the group. 86% responded correctly that there are two complaints. The complaints are about the broken call light and her pureed food that she doesn't want to eat anymore. The training materials that you have include some training tips in the quiz answer sheet, and there are important reminders for the trainers because these tips for this scenario is to remember that since this case has two complaints, the case cannot be closed until both complaints have a final outcome, which we call a disposition. Next scenario. Maria, if I can jump in really quickly. Um, this is Amity. Yes. We received a question <clears throat> that applies to any case or complaint, so I just wanted to bring it up. Um, one of the, the question was if informed consent is needed uh, to investigate a case and a complaint, and, and yes, as part of ombudsman work, you're resident directed, so you would need uh, consent. If the resident can't provide consent, then you would need consent from their representative if available. If not, then <clears throat> you can uh, work the complaint at, at following your state policies and procedures. So just wanted to clarify that. Um, thank you. Thank you. And, <clears throat> this is Louise, and I would just add, um, as a reminder, there is a, a training on the NORC website that covers complaint handling and um, really gets in depth on that type of an answer. So um, if you haven't looked at it, uh, take a look at that. Okay. So scenario number three. I love this one because this is so typical. A certified nursing assistant approaches you about the new director of nursing. She says the DON does not listen to the staff and is very patronizing when she gives instructions to them. The staff do not like working with her and several of them are looking for jobs somewhere else. She asks you to intervene with management on behalf of the staff. We will administer the poll. We ask that you choose if it's a case information and assistance or neither. Two percent said case, eleven percent said information and assistance, and eighty seven percent said neither. You're right, it's C, this is neither, this is not a case, and you should not intervene because the concern was not made by or behalf of a resident or resident. But if you provide information or suggestions, you may count it as information and assistance to a facility staff person. So it's kind of one of those questions where the answer is at this moment, it's not a case, and it's not information and assistance, so we're calling it neither, but if you did provide information and assistance to the facility staff person, you might could then count it as an INA. The training tip on the materials reminds users to discuss appropriate responses an ombudsman could provide to the CNA, such as explaining the role of the program as a resident advocate and suggesting that the CNA share her concerns with the facility administrator the HR director or the facility's internal complaint process. If several staff members do resign due to the treatment of the new DON leaving and they leave the facility and then the facility is under staff and it's negatively impacting the quality of care or life for the residents, then it could become a, a case. Next slide, please. Okay, just one second. My screen went blank on me. Okay, now I can see it. <laughs> um, next slide, Katie. And it may be there and I just can't see it on my screen because it looks like my computer has frozen. So good thing that I have some paper copies. Okay, and so Maria, scenario. Um, there was, yes. There was a question that maybe I could just tell me discuss real quickly. Um, again, this yes, gets please. at complaint processing and, and when is it a complaint or, you know, what if you don't have consent? So I really do encourage 
those of you who have not reviewed the complaint handling webinar to go back and review that. So the question is if a resident voices a complaint but does not want you to take any action, is this a case? And so it depends on a couple things. If somebody else, say a daughter or a son called in and had a complaint on behalf of the resident and you go to the resident and then they say, I don't want to, I don't want your uh, assistance, you still have a case in the complaint. There was a complainant, um, but the resident did not want you to take action. So that's one scenario. A resident may voice a complaint, but then they don't want you to take action. And then it would not be a case because they've told you not to take action. So it could be an information and assistance. You may hear the same complaint from other residents or if it's something and around about the environment that you observe, you as the ombudsman could be the complainant. Um, so, you know, some of these are not always, answers are not always hard and fast, but basically if a resident directly complains to you about something but then says don't do anything, you would not have a case. Thank you, Louise. So for the fourth scenario, one morning you receive five notices of discharge from four different nursing homes. The homes are complying with their federal requirement to send copies of those discharge notices to the Ombudsman program. We'll administer the slide, please. So the question is, is this a case? Information and assistance are neither. Twelve percent said case, ten percent said information and assistance, and seventy eight percent said neither. The receipt of these notices is neither a case nor an information and assistance, so neither would be the correct answer. And we'll talk about why on the next slide. So next slide. Okay, so this is where it's really beneficial to look back at these uh, training tips as part of the resources. This is comprised of a complainant, one or more complaints, documentation of a perpetrator, whether it's uh, if it involves abuse, neglect, or exploitation, setting, verification, resolution, and information regarding any referrals to another agency. And also remember the definition of a complaint is an expression of dissatisfaction or concern brought to or initiated by the Ombudsman Program, which requires Ombudsman Program investigation and resolution on behalf of one or more of the residents of a facility. In the scenario that we just described, the Ombudsman Program is not yet actively involved in investigating and working to resolve the discharges, and no one has asked them to do so on behalf of a resident. Rather, the nursing facilities are just sending the notices as a part of their routine compliance with one of their requirements. The training tips state the following. If you follow up with a resident who received the notice, or if one of them or their representative contacts you, you, the ombudsman, may have a case or an information and assistance. It's a case, once again, if the resident or their uh, representative who contacted you asks for your help in investigating and intervening and working on the solution. But if they're able to just if you have you provide information and then they can follow through with filing an appeal, for example, then you would code it as information and assistance. Let's see, if the resident or the representative asks you to investigate, identify the options and help them either stay in the facility or find another solution, it would be a case with one complaint. And as always, we encourage you to refer back to these charts and the basic principles for any additional information or if you're not sure how to respond. 
So this is the fifth scenario. Mrs. Oliver asks you to help her obtain the medical records for her mother, who lives in a nursing home. Mrs. Oliver asked the facility for the records seven days ago, and the facility has not responded. She is her mother's healthcare durable power of attorney and responsible party. Administer the poll, please. Please choose the correct answer. Sixty-three percent said case, nine percent said information and assistance, and twenty-eight percent said depends. Okay. So the twenty-eight percent got the wrong answer because it depends. This may be a case with one complaint, or it may not be a case. The difference depends upon how Mrs. Oliver wants you to help. If you conduct an investigation, work to help. Ms. Oliver obtain her mother's medical records, it's in a case. The complaint is Mrs. Oliver, who is the daughter and the resident representative. But if you provide information on the process to access the resident records to help the daughter, Mrs. Oliver, it's then recorded as information and assistance. Next slide. So Maria, we're having a little audio trouble. Um, so maybe I'll go ahead and take the next scenario. Okay, thank Can you. you. And I'm hoping that sounded much clearer. Um, I'm hoping that I'm coming through clearly. Um, so we are on scenario six. A facility staff person tells you that Mrs. Staff's, Mrs. Smith's son, who has power of attorney for his mother, is verbally abusing Mrs. Smith, using her income for his own purposes, and has not paid her bill for three months. The staff person requests your involvement in resolving the non-payment issue. So, um, what is this? Do we have a poll here? Okay, is it a case? Is it information and assistance, or is it neither? So 58% said case, 19% said information and assistance, and 23% said neither. And Maria, do you want to see if your audio is better? Yes, let's see if it works. Uh, the answer to the question is A, case. To so this scenario, it is a case. Is my audio better? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you, Louise, for helping out. So we'll go to the next slide. So in that particular case, how many complaints are in that case? Choose the correct answer. Either one complaint, two, or three. Eighteen percent said one, sixty percent said two, and twenty two percent said three. Correct answer is B two. There are two complaints with facility staff as the complainant. If the resident is at risk of discharge for non payment, then you could add a third complaint. So Maria <clears throat> I just want to jump in real quick because yes. we've had um, some questions about this scenario. One of which was asking why is this scenario a case? It was not brought by brought to the ombudsman by a resident or a resident representative, and there's not permission from a resident or resident representative. So, just as a reminder, as you're going through this quiz, assume that you do have resident permission to work the case. So that was mentioned earlier, and it's in the quiz. And secondly. It can still be a case 
if it's not brought by the resident or resident representative, it was on behalf of or concerning a resident. So like Maria just said, it was brought by facility staff and worked by the ombudsman program, assuming you have permission from the resident in order to um, protect the residents and investigate whether it's financial exploitation and potentially becoming a discharge issue. So just wanted to mention that. Thank you. And just to emphasize, you know, we have a variety of categories of who can be a complainant. So it can be the ombudsman, facility staff, et cetera. Um, so just, you know, keep that in mind. And then there's the complaint processing steps you take, which includes obtaining resident or resident representative consent or the exceptions when there is no representative and the resident does not have capacity to give consent. Thank you, Louise and Amity. And I'm really thankful that all of you who are listening are, are submitting your questions and that we can take some now. So thank you. Yeah. So for scenario. I have one more. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that, Maria. Okay. It, the questions are coming in fast and furious about this particular scenario. Excellent. So okay. the other question uh, that was related is why was scenario six a case if scenario five was depends? And the answer is because number five, um, Mrs. Oliver asked you to obtain the medical records. Yes, you're assuming that they have permission. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but the difference depends on how Mrs. Oliver wants you to help. If you conduct an investigation to work on helping obtain the medical records, then it's a case. If And the complainant is the family member. Um, if you provide information and assistance on how to access those records, for example, explaining what residents' rights are related to getting those records to Ms. Oliver, then it's information and assistance. You haven't taken action on the case to get those records. So just wanted to clarify that as well. Great questions. Thank you. Okay. Next slide, Katie. So Mr. Jones calls the Ombudsman program complaining that his mother has a black eye and the facility can give no explanation for it. He asks you to check on her and cautions you that his mother has Alzheimer's and does not remember things accurately. You visit his mother and notice light bruises on her face and arms but cannot verify that she had a black eye. If you'll administer the poll, please. Okay, 91% said case, 4% said information and assistance, and 5% said neither. Okay. So it is a case, so the correct answer is A, case, and there is one complaint. The ombudsman initiates a complaint investigation, determines if the complaint can be verified, and then works to resolve the complaint, whether the complaint can be verified or not. The complainant is Mr. Jones, the son, because he is the one concerned about her black eye and asked you to check on his mother. Next slide. Okay, scenario number eight. So let me check. I think this is the one. No, we got a longer one coming up. This one's kind of lengthy. During a facility visit, two residents tell you that they would like to have water available, but no one brings it when they ask. They are afraid to ask again and say that it must be an oversight because staff are always rushed. They do not want to complain anymore. As you continue your visit, you notice that several other residents who cannot get out of bed do not have water at their bedside tables. Some of the residents cannot communicate with you. You do not see any staff filling containers or distributing water while you are visiting. Katie, if you'll administer the poll, please. And if you'll look at and choose the correct answer, if it's case, information and assistance, or neither.
95% said case, 3% said information and assistance, and 3% said neither. Okay, excellent. So with the 95%, the answer is correct. It's A, case. And there was one complaint, and the complaint is uh, not providing water accessible to the to the residents. Next slide. It's a follow up to that same question. So we're going to administer this poll, and this time we're asking, who is the complainant? Choose the correct answer: either resident, ombudsman program, or facility staff. Okay, 20% said resident, 80% said ombudsman program, and 0% said facility staff. Okay, so yes, the correct answer is B, ombudsman program is the complainant. Because the ombudsman is the one who observed numerous residents who are affected by the problem of not having enough water. And you did talk to the two that complained about it, but they did not give you permission to resolve this on, on their behalf. Since you observed this on your own and do not have permission, you would address this as a complainant since you noticed it and that it impacted several residents. So the correct answer is B, Ombudsman Program. Okay, next slide, number nine. Mr. Daughter, Mr. Brown's daughter and guardian, Alice, asked the Ombudsman Program calls the ombudsman program, excuse me, because she's concerned that her father is eating all of his meals in his room instead of in the dining room. You visit Mr. Brown, who seems despondent and is unable to express his wishes. You speak with the director of nursing about Alice's concern. And the DON staff says that staff should be taking Mr. Brown to the dining room and that she'll discuss the problem with the two new nursing assistants and will put a note in Mr. Brown's chart. The following week, you call Alice, who tells you the nursing assistants are taking her father to the dining room now, and he appears much happier. So, Katie, if you'll administer the poll, please. Choose the correct answer if it's a case, information and assistance, or neither. Eighty-nine percent said case, nine percent said information and assistance, and two percent said neither. Okay. So it is a case, and there is only one complaint, and that's made by Alice. And Alice is the complainant. She's the um, daughter and the resident representative, and then there's the one complaint about not going to the dining room. So good job. Next slide is scenario number 10. Ms. Miller is a resident of Sunny Valley Assisted Living Facility. She stops you in the hall and tells you she has a problem. Her son who lives at home just lost his Medicaid benefits and she is concerned he won't be able to pay for his medication. As she rolls away in her wheelchair, you notice that the wheelchair keeps veering to the left and hitting the wall. You ask if she would like your assistance in getting it fixed or possibly in getting a new chair? And she replies, yes. So let's have the poll question. Is this a case, information and assistance, or neither? Eighty-three percent said case, sixteen percent said information and assistance, and one percent said neither. Okay, so it is a case with one complaint. So the the resident said yes that she wanted the ombudsman's help in getting her wheelchair repaired or replaced. Now, if she had, if she had asked. She did. She, well, she mentioned that her son, right, had lost his Medicaid and she was worried about his medications. 
if you had been able to provide her information that may be of assistance to her husband or her son, that would be an information and assistance. The next poll question is still relevant to this question. We're asking, who is the complainant? So if we'll administer the poll and we'll choose the correct answer. Was the complainant the resident, the ombudsman program, or the facility staff? Sixty-seven percent said resident, thirty-two percent said ombudsman program, and one percent said facility staff. Okay. So the resident is the complainant. So the choice correct answer is A, resident. Once the ombudsman brings a problem to the resident's attention and the resident acknowledges the problem and gives you permission to resolve it, then the resident becomes the complainant. And as I mentioned just a while ago, if you tell her how her son can appeal the Medicaid determination, you could document that as an information and assistance to an individual. Thanks, Maria. That's actually what I was going to highlight because we had a couple questions come in about asking why it's not both. It's, it could be both, as she said, if you did provide information and assistance, but there was no, in that scenario, there wasn't anything in there about providing that information and assistance, and that's why it was a case. However, it could be both, so just uh, keep that in mind. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. A facility administrator calls you to complain that the volunteer ombudsman assigned to his home is not doing her job. He explains that he informed her about a behavior the facility was having with a res. Well. He was calling her to inform her about a problem the facility was having with the resident's behavior, but she refused to address the facility's concern. Instead, she visited privately with the resident and refused to tell the administrator or the corporate lawyer about her visit. If you'll administer the poll, please, and answer if this is a case, information and assistance, or if it's neither a case or information and assistance. Eleven percent said case, twenty-seven percent said information and assistance, and sixty-two percent said neither. Okay. It's not a case because the concern was not made by or on behalf of the resident. Remember, it was the facility complaining about a resident's behavior. But if you did provide information to the administrator on the role of the ombudsman, you could count that as an information and assistance. So the correct answer, as it was presented, is C, neither. But as a follow-up to that, if you did provide information to the administrator about the role of the ombudsman, then you could count it as information and assistance. Okay. Next slide. So this is the one I was thinking about a while ago. This one's a little bit long. So. Mrs. Lee's daughter called you to complain that her mother would like to take a bath more often than once a week. On December the 15th, you go to Hilltop Haven to visit Mrs. Lee. On your way to her room, you notice that there is a dirty laundry on the floor in the hall and that the hall is dark because several lights are not working. When you visit Mrs. Lee, she says that she wants to be bathed more often than once a week. Next slide. After you visit with her, you, stop, you drop by to see Mrs. James. She tells you that they stopped her physical therapy and she does not know why. She complains that the sliding track for the privacy curtain is broken, so it does not close all the way, and you investigate both complaints. You resolve and close the PT complaint within the week. You learn that the facility has tried to order a new track, but it's on back order. You keep the complaint open until the new track is installed and then you go back to visit her in January. She tells you that they are installing the track the next day. 
She also tells you that she just received a notice from the facility saying that she will have to switch to the facility pharmacy, even though it may cost more than the pharmacy she has been using for the past three years. You tell her you'll check into it for her. So if you would administer the poll, please, and choose the answer if it's a case, information and assistance, or neither. Ninety-eight percent said case, two percent said information and assistance, and zero percent said neither. Right. So for the first, um, the first case, the first complaint regarding wanting more frequent showers, that was one case. And then there's two complaints about um, in case two, the ombudsman program can be the complainant when the ombudsman identifies a problem that affects numerous residents, you know that, and can address the complaint without disclosing the identity of the residents, such as a general environmental concern. And, but with Mrs. James, there were three complaints, right? It was possible that Mrs. James's pharmacy complaint could be a separate case or complaint. It really kind of depends on whether you open one or two cases for Mrs. James it would depend on your state's policy and the amount of time between her complaints. Remember the very first one started with, I believe it was December the 15th. And um, if, you, if she had had more, one or more complaints in December and January and all the complaints were resolved in February, you would close the case in February. If she then brought one or more complaints forward in March, you would open a new case. However, in the case cited, it is both a judgment, judgment call and a state policy decision. Amity, are there any questions about that one? No, uh, no, there okay. aren't. Okay, good. All right, I think we're next to the next one, which is number 12. Oh, we're still on the same, okay. Who is the complainant for the first case that involved a complaint about additional showers? So you need to choose the correct answer. Was it the resident, the ombudsman program, or the resident's daughter? Forty-three percent said resident, one percent said ombudsman program, and fifty-six percent said resident's daughter. It's the resident's daughter, Mrs. Lee's daughter. Although you visited the resident and followed her direction, Mrs. Lee's daughter initiated the complaint. Therefore, the daughter is the complainant. So this afternoon, we have gone through the summary um, of the NORS overview. We have gone quickly through the part one training materials, kind of described the basic principles, the quiz, the quiz answer sheet. We've looked at the resource, which is table one, NORS part A, B, and C, case and complaint codes, values, and definitions. And all of you have participated in the quiz, which I'm really thankful your participation was great, had good responses. And so now we're gonna open it. I'm gonna turn it back over to facil uh, Amity and she is gonna facilitate any more questions that you might have. Thanks, Maria. And thank you all for participating in the quiz and providing um, some really great questions for discussion. So I'm gonna actually, before we get to the other questions, I'm gonna go back and touch on some about the quizzes. I wanted to clarify, we received a question saying it was confusing, especially the complaint about the water issue where the residents didn't give permission to uh, work the case. So then the complainant became the ombudsman program um, because it impacted everybody. The question was, well, you mentioned earlier to assume that you have permission from the resident, and that's correct. So I should have clarified that in this quiz, both in the training materials that we've provided and in today's webinar, 
unless it's specifically noted in the scenario that you don't have consent from the resident, assume that you do in order to work the case. So just wanted to clarify that. Um, we also had a couple questions come in about the broken wheelchair complaint, um, mentioning that the ombudsman identified the problem or at least noticed the problem and then asked the resident about it, got the resident's consent to work the complaint and then the resident becomes the complainant. Um, a couple commenters felt that that seemed inconsistent since the ombudsman program noticed the complaint, uh, the issue. However, I, I hear you and Louise, feel free to jump in too, but um, since the resident gave the ombudsman permission to work the case and it specifically impacts that resident, then the resident becomes the complainant and the ombudsman, you know, follows resident direction from here on out. If it was maybe there's um, several wheelchairs in a hallway that look like they're not working and it impacts multiple residents, then the ombudsman would take that complaint or if they see several that seem in disrepair as they're watching residents move around the facility, then the ombudsman would be the complainant for that. Um, I hope that's a little clearer. Any, Louise, did you wanna add anything to that? If so, feel free. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think you touched on the main points. Um, you know, and sometimes it's not an exact science, but I think the key part here is that you observed something of a particular resident. So that's kind of the key. Uh, but, and then approaching them, are you concerned about this? Do you want assistance? Yes. So it's more about you're pointing out an observation. Um, so the resident, oh yeah, you're right. I do want some help. So they're, they're the complainant there. And then, in the other instance, um, the ombudsman program might, again, see something that affects a lot of residents. It's not specific to one resident, um, or it could be specific to a resident who is not able to provide consent because they don't have capacity and they don't have a representative. So you become a complainant on behalf of that resident. So that's an example of maybe where you'd be more directly involved as the complainant on behalf of a single resident. So also along this uh, same vein, some commenters are saying, well, then that's not really consistent about the case when the daughter calls in about bathing and you get resident permission to work that case, yet the daughter is still the complainant. So just as a clarification, the reason the daughter is still the complainant and not the resident is because the daughter brought the complaint originally to the ombudsman program. It is a little bit different if the ombudsman program observes something, calls it to the attention of the resident, and the resident gives permission to work the case. So that's why the resident is the complainant in the situation with the wheelchair, and the daughter is the complainant in the scenario about the bathing. I hope that is a little bit clearer. Um, so let me go back. Thank you all so much for all your questions. There's a lot coming in uh, pretty quickly. So I do want to touch on uh, the scenario four. So Katie, could you go back to the slide with scenario four on it, please? <clears throat> this is the one involving the discharge notices. Um, <clears throat> The question was, should discharge notices received from facilities not be opened as a case until the ombudsman speaks with the resident or rep to determine if it's a case or information assistance? And would it depend on if the resident wants um, ombudsman involvement in the situation? Yes, um, as we mentioned in the answer for this, it is not <clears throat> a case because the facility is just complying with the federal requirements for them to send the notice to the ombudsman program. So unless you take action on the case, you do not open it as a case automatically just because you receive the notice. Now, if you receive the notice, reach out to the resident and or the resident representative. They want your assistance in trying to either appeal it or just working with the facility to um, uh, to not discharge the resident, then you would obviously open that as a case. Or if you reach out to the resident and or resident representative, inform them of their rights, but they don't want you involved and you provide information and assistance about how they could advocate for themselves, 
then that would count as information and assistance. Louise, was there anything you want to add to that? Uh, I think he hit the main points. It, I, I would like to actually, though, um, Katie, if you could go back to where was it? Towards the beginning where we have the table that shows the difference between a case and a complaint. Um, let's see if we start on even slide 14 and 15. If you look at those steps between the difference between a case and a complaint, I, I mean a case and a, there I go, information and assistance, you'll see there's very distinct steps to take in complaint processing right? Starting with, um, you know, offering privacy to the resident, um, getting, gathering the facts, obtaining uh, consent. So it's, you know, all of those steps involved, getting the resident perspective about what they want out of the complaint, and then, you know, consent to take action. Um, so that's, you know, there's quite a few steps when you are um, working on a complaint. Um, as opposed to information and assistance, which you know is really just receiving a question and giving the information and resources. So with these transfer discharge notices, you don't know what they are. They are pieces of information. And until you go and talk to a resident, okay, you talk to the resident, maybe they say, um, I'm done with this place, I don't wanna go back. So you give them information on how to choose a facility and you're done. It's not a case. You gave them information. And again, the facility is just meeting a regulatory requirement. They are not sending over all those discharge notices to say, these are all complaints that residents have. They're just saying, here's what we've done. Here's who we're transferring or discharging. Um, so yeah, it's. I know there's some different schools of thought, but I would like to reinforce that it requires the program to take action, regardless of whether it's a complaint, a case and a complaint, or even action just to call the resident um, for information and assistance. Um, it just can't be immediately documented as a case and a complaint without, again, the complaint processing steps. Um, and so, you know, I would say it's not an automatic and, and until you find out what the resident wants, that determines what it is, a uh, case and complaint or information and assistance. Thanks, Louise. <clears throat> so I, I wanna reiterate again, cause we received another comment. <clears throat> Identifying the source of a complaint based on consent or scope of the problem is challenging we'd be changing the complainant during the course of a case and shouldn't that be identified at intake? Um, I just wanna clarify again, there weren't, unless I'm misspeaking, any other scenarios that the complainant uh, changed. And that's actually what we're saying with this training is whoever contacts the ombudsman program first is the complainant. The only situation where it seemed a little different was the variation, um, that scenario about the wheelchair when the ombudsman noticed that the wheelchair was not working properly and asked the resident if they wanted help with it. So again, the complainant is the original person that brings that complaint to your attention, uh, whether it's facility staff, family member, resident representative, or so on. And then you get resident um, consent to work the case and you move forward. So hope that's clear. I agree with you. It would be very confusing if you had to switch it back and forth. So that's that's not the intent at all. So I didn't want you to walk away from this training thinking that was the point. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think there's been some past confusion about, well, if the daughter calls and then the resident agrees with the issue, then the resident's the complainant. But no, the daughter's the original complainant. So just to reinforce, you don't change who the complainant is, but you do seek to get consent from the resident when when possible, um, but that doesn't change whoever the in original complainant was. And it's important to kind of stick to that because we want to have a sense of who's, who's um, raising issues on behalf of residents. Um, and you can even see probably in your own data, you know, that maybe when you have 
complaints by facility staff that maybe those complaints don't necessarily represent the resident interests. Often they do, but sometimes they don't. So you can kind of see um, over time as, as complaints add up, kind of what are the trends? You know, when residents um, complain, um, what are the outcomes? When facility staff complain, what are the outcomes? So it's important to keep that, um, you know, original who raised the issue. And yes, we have added a little, uh, I guess for some folks it might be a gray area to the one example, but again, it's the ombudsman was pointing out something to the resident. So that, that's kind of a one minor um, change there, but the ombudsman, you know, pointed it out to the resident and they agreed, yes, I want to, this is my issue. So. Louise? Um, Thanks, Louise. One person um, asked the question, what if the resident does not agree with the complainant? Thanks, Carol. I was just about to get to that, so thank oh, you. Um, <laughs> no, that's okay. So yes, to reiterate, and the, if the resident doesn't agree with the complainant, which absolutely can happen, then you would open a complaint at the time that the complainant contacts you. You contact the resident. If they say it's not an issue, then it would be the disposition would be withdrawn or no action needed. And to kind of piggyback on what Louise was saying, I, I feel like programs may feel like that's a negative on them if there's several cases where there's no action needed, um, but that's not necessarily the case. It really shows that at least um, uh, family members or friends of residents know how to contact your program. They know to reach you if they have a complaint, and then you're following resident direction, whether they want you involved in resolving that issue or the resident may not even see it as an issue like their daughter does or whoever contacted you. So that doesn't mean it's a, it's a negative thing or counts against the program if you have to withdraw or say no action needed. You're simply reflecting what the resident wants. So. And, and I would add to that, you're also, you know, some of those complaints that come in where the resident doesn't want action, they could be true problems, but the resident may fear retaliation or doesn't want to make waves. So you're capturing, issues that are happening at the facility and it's good information as that information you know you know kind of builds over time where you can see well this is a problem what are some other ways we can tackle it so i would just stress it's really important to consider those cases and complaints even if you don't get very far with complaint investigation because it it informs you of what is truly happening um, you know, at the facility or of the concerns that people have. So, and there was one other question. Um, again, this is kind of about uh, complaints, um, maybe that come in from facility staff and they they want help from um, in, in assisting a resident who they see as challenging. Um, so, um, there's, I may not quite understand the full question, but I want to re-emphasize that facility staff can call in with a complaint about a concern about a resident, um, but that I think this person wants to make it clear that you can't call just to complain about residents. Um, so again, something where the facility calls, it may be an information and assistance. Um, if they have a concrete problem, um, regarding a resident, then you go talk to that resident, get their perspective, and take action as directed by the resident. Thanks, Louise. <clears throat> so we received another question, and, and I'm gonna, I may not get the, the gist of it, but I think it's asking about those situations where information, initially you're providing information and assistance, and then it kind of, as you get more involved or the resident starts reaching out to or the family member, it can become a complaint. So I wanted to touch upon uh, the chart and the basic principles um, we highlighted on, um, Katie, I think if you could go forward a couple slides. There you go, that one's good. Okay, so documentation, oh sorry, go back one, thank you. On documentation, um, if you 
are currently working an active case and you provide information and assistance that's part of that case. It's related to the complaint you're working on. Um, it's maybe you're talking about resident rights and, and it relates to the complaint that you're working on with that resident. Then that's documented in your case notes. However, similar to, and I can't remember what scenario it was, um, about the son with the Medicaid, if you are working a case and then something completely unrelated to that case comes up, um, that could be a separate information and assistance activity. It doesn't fall under your case notes um, for the case. So just wanted to clarify that there will be situations where you're already actively working a case and it's very possible that you have information assistance that's not related to that and you would code, um, code that as an information assistance activity. So. And then, Andy, I, like I think it's another kind of question is sometimes you might, and I remember having this happen, somebody calls and they have a question, uh, maybe it's about a, a discharge or a, you know, trying to get a refund or whatever, and you give them information and call it information and assistance and you're done. And then two weeks later, they call back and they say, you know, I've tried to do this on my own and I can't, I need your help. And it becomes a, a case and a complaint. And so it's not like it negates the first information and assistance. That's still there. Um, you, But you're now at the point where you add add that case and you start a case and complaint. And, um, you know, because sometimes people want to just try and work it themselves and then, you know, they do and they don't get as far as they'd like and they call back for that that next step of getting more help. So that can happen. Thank you, Louise. Okay, Katie, if you can go forward to the resource slide. And I know we didn't get to all the questions that came in today. However, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are going to be combing through the questions asked during these webinars and asked as part of the work group whenever we were developing these materials and come up with some frequently asked questions about the revised NORS and we'll provide additional training about that in the future. So um, thank you all for your questions. So I just wanted to reiterate the resources that we currently have available on the website. Uh, this is the landing page for NORS on the NORC website. Uh, the bulleted list identifies the types of resources available to you already. And as you can see, the last bullet is the link that will take you to the revised NORS data collection information, which is where this webinar recording and the previous, the introductory webinar recording and training materials are going to be posted. Next slide. And this is a shot of the revised NORS data collection materials. As you can see, we've added uh, quite a bit since um, the last webinar. We've added the webinar recordings and then obviously the revised NORS training materials. As I mentioned in the introductory webinar, we will be sending out the revised training materials prior to each uh, webinar um, about a week or a few days before each webinar and then they'll be posted on the website as well. Next slide, please. So just as a reminder, Ombudsman programs will begin using the revised NORS codes, definitions, and activities on October 1st, 2019. That is federal fiscal year 2020. The Office of the State Ombudsman will submit federal fiscal year 2020 data in January 2021. There are several components of NORS, such as narrative examples of advocacy work that the Office of the State Ombudsman writes and submits along with data to ACO. This webinar series will highlight areas of the revised NORS that are pertinent to you and your work. So please remember not to use the new codes or definitions until October 1st. Next slide. All state ombudsmen and representatives of the office are encouraged to attend this webinar series. Uh, if you've registered for this webinar, then you're currently or automatically registered for the entire series. Webinars will be recorded and recordings and materials will be emailed to attendees after each webinar and available on the NORC website. The next webinar is the part two webinar about coding complaints and that's March 19th from 3 to 4.30 Eastern time. We did receive some questions about certificates of attendance 
and those will be generated by GoToWebinar at the end of the webinar series for everyone that registered and, att and attended the entire series. We are also sending lists of attendees to State Ombudsman as well. Next slide. So um, here is our contact information. You're more than welcome to reach out to us in between these webinars with any questions that you have. Don't hesitate. Next slide. And as usual, thanks for joining today's webinar. Thank you so much, Louise and Maria, for your presentations and for Katie for working your magic behind the scenes with webinar slides and polls. There will be a brief survey at the end of today's webinar and we'd appreciate your comments and suggestions. For more information about NORS or any assistance needed, don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can find our website here and also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. So. Thank you all again for your time today. Louise, did you have any last comments that you wanted to provide? Um, just thank you everybody for participating. And as you can see, and as I recall, when we've done these types of trainings in the past, it brings up lots of questions about practice, the actual hands-on practice of investigating complaints that go beyond NORS. Um, so it's just kind of a reminder that it's complicated, and um, but I, we're, we're trying to stick to the basics, and so use this uh, training as a foundation for your work going forward. And certainly, we will be developing FAQs, and you've asked a lot of great questions and have a lot of great observations, so thank you for that. Thank you all. Have a great rest of your afternoon. <laughs> Bye-bye.